Oh man, some of my generations with stable diffusions are so boring. Isn't there a way to make them more interesting? Burly noise, Voronoi, Perturbance, which is just a fancy name for noise. Have you ever thought that your generation with stable diffusion are boring? Take this image for example. We are asking for an abstract still life photography of rocks and flowers with a white backdrop and the resulting generation, well, it's correct, but it's nothing groundbreaking. Yes, we got some rocks and flowers, but they're not in an interesting composition. The table is kind of boring, the light is kind of boring. What if the solution was making some noise? Today we are going to take a look at how noise, and random noise in particular, can affect generations. As always, you'll be able to find the workflow in the description below, as well as any other notes you might need for this to work. But first of all, let's take a step back and let's see what I mean by noise and where does it come from. And in order to do that, let's step into Blender. Now, this won't be a mixed 3D and stable diffusion tutorial, but in order to understand how I think about noise, we have to think about how noise influences 3D shapes. When I was first starting out using 3D software like Blender or Houdini, I saw a lot of tutorials that used random noise in order to influence the shape of meshes and get some interesting results out of those basic shapes. Like in this example, if we start from this sphere and we add some random noise to the offset position, we get an interesting shape. Or if we start from this plane and do the same, we get this interesting shape out of it. And noise can be manipulated in a lot of different ways in order to influence those shapes better. So we can influence the scale, for example, and we get this ripple effect. Or we could influence lacunarity and get a more mellow or a more harsh sort of modifier. All of these things can be applied inside of Stable Diffusion as well. So what we will be working with today inside of Stable Diffusion is noise. Here we have two examples of random noise. We have a Perlin noise and a Voronoi noise. While they have a different texture, and as such they can be better in some cases and others, what they are at its core is maps. And as such they can be used inside of generation pipelines whenever we can use maps to influence results. And when we are generating, maps allow us to give a set of instructions. And these instructions will be based on the characteristics of these maps. Usually when we think of instructions we think of set rules. We don't want to have random instructions, we want to have specific rules. But the more you try to be specific, the less interesting the results will be. Whereas with random noise you get a degree of chaotic instructions. And that can be useful as well as we will see. Now when we first step into Stable Diffusion, be it Conf UI or any other web UIs, we are presented with what is basically a sandbox. Now some web UIs have more roles than others. In our case with Conf UI there are basically no roles because those roles we set are the ones that we set with the nodes and we decide which nodes to put into our workflow. But the thing is, there are very limited roles to a generation. At its most basic, a generation is just a text-to-image generation with a load checkpoint, a clip text and code node that acts as positive and negative field, a case sampler, a latent image, and a resulting image that gets decoded. But we can add roles, and we can bend those roles. For example, one might say we can condition the results and if I'm saying conditioning, the first thing that comes to mind is ControlNet. ControlNet influences the conditioning. As we can see here, it accepts a conditioning input and spits out a conditioning output. And the way that noise can work is, for example, by setting it as a depth map. Now, in my case here, I'm using a Perlin noise node to create a black and white depth map. This map gets used as an input for the control net, which at this time is at a very low strength, 0.31, and even at that low strength, it influences the results so much. This result here is already much more interesting than whatever we have here. But again, these are rules we set and we can bend them however much we want. ConfUI and other web UIs at a degree are modular. So why not bring in a black and white gradient as well that can act as our table? If we blend that with our Perlin noise, we get this. This has a sense of randomness to it, but it also sets the depth in terms of perspective of what we want to achieve. And if we hit Q prompt, we can see that that depth is respected. There is both some randomness that derives from the Perlin noise and some control 
that derives from our gradient mask. Generating is all about taming randomness in a way that doesn't constrain it too much. So what we could do in this example is just use a node that lets us draw something. In this case, for example, I want to draw the overall shape that I want my rocks and flowers to have. And I want to place that on top of our gradient plus random noise map. And if we hit Q prompt again, we can see how that is respected. This result here is light years from the original result that we're getting with just a positive prompt field text box. And we get this by just concatenating different modules, different building blocks. But we don't have to stop there. There are other ways of influencing results that are not just a part of conditioning. We can also influence the latency, for example. In this example over here, I am taking the original image and I am extracting a color palette. Then I am blending that color palette with the random noise that I've generated. And if I hit Q prompt, we get a different result, which takes into account both the palette of our original image and the random noise that we created. Now, this example here doesn't take into consideration the control net depth conditioning because the positive conditioning comes straight from the clip text encode positive field. But if we wanted to, we could just apply the control net as well as the latent. And if we hit Q prompt, we can see that we get this kind of result that is both conditioned by the control net and by the latent that we created through a mishmash of our palette, original image and noise. Now, the most important thing that I would like for you to understand out of this is that the only set of rules that exists is the one that we impose ourselves. In this case, I am using control net as depth, for example, but that doesn't mean that you have to do that the same way as I do. You can use it as a liner. You can use it as an IC light mask. You can use it as Kenny. You can use it as whatever. Or another example, in this case, I am using just a Perlin noise, but what we could do is just search up for another other kind of noise, in this case Voronoi, which is much more spiky and cellular in appearance, which would not be great by itself for what we are trying to do. But if we blend it with our Perlin noise, for example, and we set it to darken and I don't know 0.35 and we connect it to the original blending and we preview the image, we can see that we get some different shapes out of it. And with different shapes come different results. And all those results can be interesting. And they are for sure much more interesting than the original, very boring, very correct, very right image that we get at the start. And once again, for those in the back, generating interesting results is all about controlling randomness up to the degree that we want. If in your case, for example, you want to have the shape that you're drawing stand out more from the actual noise that you are creating, you can just add the value of the blending for the shape that you're creating. So let's say we go to 0 0.88. And this way, there is less random noise and more design. There is no correct way of doing things. There is only the best way you can come up with for a specific scenario that you want to solve. So try to shy away from the conditioning and sets of rules that you think you have to follow and actually try to break things. At the worst, you've spent, what, a couple of hours trying to do something new and it didn't stick? At best, you've created something new and useful for either you or someone else. Now, if you're interested in why I did things this way with this workflow, let's analyze things bit by bit. The first generation is a very basic text to image generation. And usually I start all my workflows like that. I want to have a baseline. But once that baseline has been set, I find that at least in my case, I tend to visualize conditioning much better and in much simpler terms than other ways of affecting results, such as manipulating the model pipeline or manipulating the latents. But that's just me, it might be different for you. And so in most cases, I start off building on top of the conditioning. When I first thought about random noise and I saw the preview image for Perlin noise and I had to implement that map into something, the first thing that came to my mind was, well, this is a black and white image and being a black and white map, it can be thought of as a depth map. It's not too different from a depth map that I'm getting from Depth Anything or Zoe or Metas. And that's why I went the way of actually applying a control net based on random noise. So when we take a look at the first group here, the depth noise group, we can see that kind of reasoning that's behind it. It's just Perlin noise, control net, 
and adapt model. And if we generate with only that group active, we can have a sense of the feedback I was getting. The random noise was giving me more interesting results, but those interesting results were still a bit too random for my tastes. Another way of thinking about this is, well, this image looks cool, but is it directionable? And the answer is, it's not. And that's why I thought about adding a gradient. Gradients are directionable. Most of the times I work in a studio and a gradient light is exactly the kind of light that I have on a backdrop or on a table. And by using an image blending mode node, in this case set to darken, but once again this is not set in stone, you could blend it any other way, quite literally, I can start to get the best of both worlds. Direction in terms of gradient and randomness in terms of noise. You can start to see the modularity aspect aspect of my workflow building approach. And if we generate this way, you see that little by little we are starting to get in a spot where we can actually control and direct the generations that we get while still allowing for the noise to surprise us. And at the same time, the way still life images are usually created is by envisioning first what you want to do and then building stuff from there. And that's why we added a painter node node. Because up until this point, what you've set is basically the background, which is the gradient, and the random noise, which is the chaotic aspect of the generation that is going on on the table. But there's no shapes to confine that randomness. And by generating this way and by completing the modularity aspect of the workflow, we get to a point where we can be either satisfied with it or we might need to tinker around a bit more. But there's a reasoning behind it, there's a philosophy behind it, and that's what matters the most. And as an example of what I'm doing might not be the best. As you can see here, we switched it from lighten to darken and what we get is a very interesting result, much better actually than the one that I was using before. Or maybe not even better, but just moves into a different direction. And you never know until you start experimenting. And the same goes for the latent noise injections. For example, here I'm starting with a color palette. But you could start with literally anything. Or I am setting the denoise at 0.6, but setting it for example at 0.8 would yield a completely different result. And the truth is, you don't even have to know what to expect out of these different results. You just have to try them out and see what happens and try to understand why that happens. In this case, the denoise is at 0.8, so we don't get the same kind of blocky effect that we were getting at 0.6, but what we get instead is this color here that gets reflected into this area of the generation. So now we know that if we want more geometry to be respected, we have to lower the denoise, and if we want more of the color and depth to be respected, we have to up the denoise a bit. When you are building workflows, if you just copy and paste whatever others are preparing for you, you might not discover new things that work for you better. Workflow design is all about contamination, about taking something from another field and applying it into stable diffusion. This workflow we've seen today is the result of one of the viewers telling me that they weren't getting interesting results out of stable diffusion, like they did in Midjourney, for example. And the first thing that came to my mind was, well, just add noise. If you're not getting interesting shapes, what's more interesting than random noise? And I knew that just because of my past dwelling in 3D softwares. And the reason why this specific video is stable diffusion for professional creatives and not experimental is because this is usable in production. Not the random noise per se, which can be useful, but the ability of thinking outside of the box to reach conclusions that others can see. If you are just copy pasting a workflow, you are not an asset to clients. You are just one of the ones who can do whatever's been done before. I am sure that all of you can come up with something new that I would never think about because I don't have your background. Or I am not faced with that specific use case, with that specific mission. So thank you all for tuning in today. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. My name is Andrea Bayoni. You can find me on Instagram at Prisonabushi or on the web at andrebayoni.com. And same as always, I will be seeing you next week.